Hello, and welcome to Exploring Intersections, Catholic Sisters on Racism, Migration, and Climate. Here's our host, Cherish Budzinski. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Exploring Intersections. Due to technical problems, I'm joining by audio only today. This program is made possible through the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, Region 10. Throughout the coming months, we're hosting panel discussions about some of the biggest social issues of our time. If you've missed our past programs, you can watch them on YouTube or download a podcast version. Today, our panel conversation focuses on restorative justice. Thought leaders are advocating for a different philosophy in the criminal justice space. What if we pivoted in our approach and focused on offender rehabilitation and reconciliation with victims and communities? What do accountability and reintegration look like? And how does restorative justice intersect with racism, migration, and climate? To help us better understand today's topic, we are joined by our panelists. Sister Kathleen Eggering is a member of the School Sisters of Notre Dame. She is a school teacher and counselor, as well as a chaplain. Sister Kathleen holds a master's degree in school counseling and is a longtime advocate for youth, having spent more than 30 years in elementary education as a teacher and school counselor. After 12 years as a high school counselor, Sister Kathleen began ministering as a chaplain to incarcerated youth, whom she lovingly calls her treasures. Welcome, Sister Kathleen. Hello, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Sister Janet Ryan is an educator, advocate, and member of, of the Sisters of St. Francis in Clinton, Iowa. Originally from Boston, Massachusetts, she is currently involved in prison ministry and advocacy at Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation on Chicago's South Side, where she has ministered for six years. She also tutors high school students. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Sciences and a Master's in Pastoral Ministry. Sister Janet enjoys biking the short distance from her home to her ministry and Lake Michigan. Welcome, Sister Janet. Thank you, Cherish. I'm very happy to be here. So let's start, first of all, from a broad perspective. The concept of restorative justice is new to so many of us. Let's begin by defining it. What exactly is restorative justice? And how does the restorative justice process compare to our current practice of incarceration? Sister Janet, let's start with you. Thank you, Cherish. I think restorative justice is a courageous way of addressing harm in which the humanity of both parties or all involved is foundational. It's an all inclusive process um, which identifies the harm that was caused, the responsible parties, um, actions needed to make reparations or to begin the healing process for those harmed. And I like um, Howard Zare's um, three R's, he says, to kind of encapsulate restorative justice. Respect, respect for everyone, for both parties. Responsibility, so the person who uh, was, caused the harm takes responsibility for that. But, and in addition, the community takes res the responsibility for their part in, in the harm that was caused. And then the last R is relationship that we are committing to being in relationship with one another and committing to that conversation, that dialogue, to listening to both sides. Great, Sister Kathleen, any additional thoughts about what exactly restorative justice is and how it differs from our current practice of incarceration? Well, restorative justice to me is uh, much more valuable because it, it brings the humanness of both sides together. It um, helps one another to understand each other. It brings them together possibly to even bring about kinship. Um, 
it's very benef it's beneficial for both sides. Uh, whereas our present criminal justice system, uh, I don't think does much for the uh, the offender, and many times they come they come out worse when they get released than when they went in. So restorative justice is definitely a plus. Great. Why is the topic of restorative justice important to each of you? Sister Kathleen, let's start with you. Well, restorative justice to me is extremely important because I work in, in a juvenile correctional treatment center and my treasures, those are the residents I work with, my treasures many times have been victims already. And so restorative justice would be beneficial to them because they would be respected and listened to and have a better self-esteem and it, it's, it's a wonderful thing because I think it's very valuable to all concerned, all, all who are concerned. Thank you for providing that uh, different perspective for us. Many of us have never worked with incarcerated youth, so that it's uh, really valuable to the conversation. Sister Janet, why is restorative justice important to you? I think it's important to me, uh, similar to what Kathleen was saying, um, that our current justice system actually causes harm to, to, I think, to both the survivor and to the person, the offender or the person who caused the harm, rather than being what we would expect um, that it, rather than being a vehicle of healing or restoration or repair. Um, our system is broken and uh, we're locking up lots of people for long periods of time and we're not addressing the harm that's experienced by the survivors and we can do better. And I think restorative justice provides that option, another alternative. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Sister Kathleen, I understand that this issue is also personal for you. Tell us about your personal journey and why you have such a deep understanding of those who come to the issue of criminal justice from a place of fear or anger. Um, in my younger year, one night I got a phone call from my mother who was frantic, who was... Um, really wiped out. Anyway, she called to tell me that my brother had been murdered. Now, mom heard this on the TV before the police even got to tell her, so that made her even more upset. Um, we went through, the family got together. We went through the funeral, through the funeral process um, it was difficult, it was devastating, and we managed. And then my older sister and I stayed with mom and dad to clean out my brother's apartment, which was extremely difficult for mom and dad. And then, um, then about a week or so later, because of the tip, they caught the gentleman and they found my brother's, my brother's things in his apartment. And so he was brought to trial. Well, my mother went to the trial. She had attended all the sessions. And she said after the trial that the judge said this, this young man is not is not capable, should not be with any other human beings. And part of the reason I think he said that is because mom said there was no feeling and, and no um, emotion shown to anyone in the room 
not even to his parents. Mother went through that, not because she liked it, but I think because she wanted a sense of justice. And then, um, oh, about a month or so, uh, excuse me, about a year or so later, my dad called and said that uh, he had written a letter to the gentleman and said that he had forget that the family had forgiven him. Well, I was so upset with my father when he told me, how can you say that? I haven't forgiven him. And I don't know if the rest of the, us have done it. How could you do that? Anyway, um, by the grace of God, and several years later, I was able to forgive the gentleman. But in this whole process, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of pain, resentment. Uh, the, the hardest thing for me was to see how it affected mom and dad. And I believe that had mom and my family had the opportunity to experience restorative justice, things would have been a lot different. We would not have gone through such a long period of anger, resentment. And then when we heard a couple of years ago that he was being released, we all experienced fear because we didn't know if he was going to come back for us. So this whole, the whole process was very, very, very upsetting to our whole family. Thank you so much, Sister Kathleen, for sharing that story. And I'm, I'm so sorry for your family's loss, but we appreciate your willingness to um, share your feelings, your very real human feelings about going through that experience in this conversation. For many people, the concept of justice is punitive and it includes incarceration and even capital punishment at times. How do we as a society effectively move beyond that concept of justice? And why is that important for us to do that? Sister Janet? I think that's a really important point, Cherish, that we are linking justice with punishment. And, and it's this automatic, a crime is committed, we gotta punish. Like, and, and we think that solves it or that's the answer. So I think that's the, the first thing, looking at that and, and maybe trying to say, what if we linked justice with questions around who has been harmed and how have they been harmed? And what can we do to bring about healing in this situation rather than that strictly um, a crime has been committed, a law has been broken, and let's punish or lock up this person. Uh, most people um, believe that when the crime happens, you lock them up, um, and that's the punitive way. But I think a way we can maybe get around that or, or transcend that is probably a better way to describe mm -hmm. it, is getting to know the offender um, and see the humanity in that person. Um, because I think we often are marginalizing and ostracizing people who commit crimes as the other and demonizing them. And um, if, if we're really going to be about justice, we need to check our judgments and our assumptions and our biases um, and open our eyes to what justice can look like in a broader sense and in, in a more restorative healing sense. Uh, and one other thing, I mean, we've learned that locking up people or using capital punishment does very little in the way of bringing about healing or restoration. Yeah, absolutely. Sister Kathleen, I know you also bring this unique perspective uh, because you have so many stories about the lives of your treasures. Why, through that lens, why do you think moving beyond the concept of justice as a punitive thing is important? Um, I believe that, that my treasures, when they come, have been victims. 
being locked up, being away from their families, being in the same situations when they get out is not, is not beneficial. But if they could, they had the opportunity to go through the process, these, these treasures would be listened to, they would be respected, they would be encouraged uh, to think differently, they would be um, better about themselves. At this point, they think they're not good. They think they are not valued. And if we could meet them, get to know them, establish a relationship with them, then they definitely would be different when they went out into the free. Absolutely. And I think it, that is so important, Sister Kathleen, that point that you brought up that we, we really, as a society, have often failed these human beings that we're talking about. And if put in a similar situation ourselves, couldn't say how we would have responded in the situations that they've faced. Right. Exactly. So in, I know, Sister Janet, you mentioned healing as one of the ways that restorative justice is a better solution than the punitive approach to criminal justice. Are there other ways that restorative justice is a better solution. Sister Kathleen, your thoughts? Um, restorative justice is a better solution because it's positive, because it's humane, because it um, enriches both sides, uh, because it brings people together instead of isolation, uh, fear, resentment. So I think restorative justice is very beneficial for all concerned. Great, Sister Janet, any additional thoughts on what makes restorative justice a better solution? I think it's also a better solution, just building on everything Kathleen said, in that it looks at the it looks at the harm that was caused from um, a broader view. So instead of just saying, "Okay, this one person committed this this one crime," it's like, what what's the story of that one person? What are the circumstances? What, what are some of the elements that are operating trauma um, trauma experienced by the, the individual? Um, racism, mental illness, poverty. Are, how are all these operating and how is the community, you know, how is there responsibility among, within the community and within our society to look at these antecedents and to address them? So we're, we're looking at healing the community as a whole, as opposed to just, not, not even just the individual, uh, rather than just, you know, locking up that individual and saying, there, the problem is solved. So, so th that's one, one thing. I think the other reason restorative justice is um, a better solution is, as Kathleen said, it, it calls us to live out of our humanity. And, and I said that earlier. I'm thinking of like to appeal to our better angels and, and seeing that in everyone and respecting everyone as a human being. And that's a higher calling for us. And right now we're not living that. Mm -hmm. And really challenging, too. I think we have to be honest about that, right? Sister mm -hmm. Kathleen, did you have something to add there? Um, two of the things that came to my mind of how they have been mistreated, many of them have been used either through trafficking or families making them sell drugs for them because they're, because they're young. Um, so I think... I think working with people brings a solution rather than just locking them up. Mm -hmm. Great. So I understand too, and the two of you have kind of touched on this, that restorative justice can have an impact on both victims and offenders. How does it benefit both? 
Sister Kathleen, your thoughts? Um, okay, in my situation, I think that my mother would have had more peace in being able to meet the gentleman, to understand what the gentleman had been through, maybe why he was the way he was. Um, I believe that it helps, it helps the offender because the offender has been um, treated with respect. The offender has experienced being valued. The offender has been included in the process. Um, the offender, I think the offender's thinking changes because of how they feel about themselves and how they're treated. And it's all for the positive. Great. Uh, just to build on that, research does show that restorative justice provides an 85% victim satisfaction rate and a 14% reduction in the frequency of reoffending. Let's talk more about that uh, reduction in the frequency of reoffending. How exactly does restorative justice work to reduce recidivism? Uh, Sister Janet? I think a lot of people who are locked up uh, live with a lot of shame. And restorative justice, so when you're carrying shame, uh, I think anger is coupled with that and self-rage, all of those things, and then being in isolation and being locked up are all very negative and harmful and they have uh, repercussions. And when some of our um, offenders are released, they reoffend because of all that what the, that was going on while they were locked up inside and externally. Um, so I, th there's a phrase, hurt people hurt people. So restorative justice helps, like there's a, a restorative justice practice called uh, victim offender dialogue. And that's where somebody who uh, a victim chooses to go meet with the offender who's locked up, for example. And in that process, there's healing for both sides. As, as Kathleen was saying, if her mother had a chance to meet that, that gentleman and, and, and maybe, and then if that gentleman had a chance to apologize and make some restitution, then, then he's going to experience healing. But we're missing both of these aspects. So um, this is one way I think restorative justice can help reduce that. Absolutely. Sister Kathleen, any additional thoughts on how restorative justice works to reduce the frequency of reoffending? I think it's because the, the offender is different in the process. They become different because of how they're treated. They become different because, because of how they begin to see themselves. If they feel valued, then they can begin to value themselves. Um, I think because of the changes that can take place in them, then they can decide they don't want to go that route anymore. They don't want to cause that pain anymore. Because I think a lot of times the offender has no idea of what the victim goes through. And when he realizes mm -hmm. that, then that can help him change also. And um, I believe, I do, I, I firmly believe that re restorative justice changes changes the um, offender mm -hmm. and 
how they how they see themselves mm -hmm. and what they can do that they never knew they could do because they never had support or respect. Right. So I believe that that really helps them and then they can make the decision, do I want to go this route again and cause this much pain to others? Do I want to be that kind of person anymore? Mm -hmm. So in what ways, I know both of you have, have worked with youth in particular, in what ways have you experienced or witnessed the success of restorative justice personally? Sister Kathleen, let's start with you. Well, while they're still incarcerated, I can see a change in them, especially when we had Epiphany, which is a three-day weekend that a party of 50 adults come in and bring God's love to them. You, we can actually see chips fall off their shoulder. We can see their attitude change. Um, while and while they're incarcerated, I can see them be more respectful. I can see them be more gentle. I can experience their um, their empathy to one another at times, which in the beginning I didn't. And then my experiences outside in the free are different. We're, we're encouraged not to connect with residents when they leave because of um, safety issues. But in one situation, I was coming out of HEB and this young girl said, sister, do you remember me? And I said, I'm sorry, no. And then she told me her name and I said, well, yes. Well, then she introduced me to her husband and then she had a, a precious two or three year old in her arms and they look so happy together. And then another time I was in Walmart and there was a, a young kid pushing a, a grocery cart with a child in it and many, a couple boxes of baby food and other things. Well, something let loose and there were cans all over the place. So I went and helped him pick up, pick up some of the things. And he looked at me and he says, I know you, you're where at City Taylor Brown? I said, yes, how are you doing? And he said, sister, I have been drug and alcohol free for over a year. Now that's great for some of these residents, mm -hmm. really good. Another situation, one of them called me and said, sister, I'm going to study to be a youth minister because I want to do what you're doing. And then um, I can't remember what the last one was, but those experiences in the free were so precious to me because it, it means they grew and matured because we were working with them face to face, respectfully, caring, and lovingly. And I believe that that's what restorative justice would do. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so powerful. Sister Janet, in what ways have you experienced or witnessed the success of restorative justice? Well, we've been talking primarily here about um, restorative justice in the context of the criminal justice system. And, and that is largely the work we do here at Precious Blood, but also there's restorative justice within our, our programming and, and with youth. So yes, I, I just wanna kind of broaden that. Great. We, we did have a, a, um, um, a situation where the courts sent a, a young man who had committed a crime, he'd broken into a house and the homeowner agreed, the homeowner was a police officer and that he agreed to come, they both agreed to come to Precious Blood and have a circle. 
And um, that police officer was very angry, rightfully so. His home had been broken into and they stole stereo things and, and other belongings. And he was angry. And when he came in, I was not there, but this is what has been um, told to me. He came in, he's like, where's the punk? You know, and, um, and the, the, the youth, the young man, I think he was like 12 or 14. He came in with his mom and um, uh, some, uh, another person to, of support. And then we had Precious Blood staff and support. And anyway, you know, they opened the circle with storytelling and, and sharing. And, and the little young boy shared that he didn't have a dad and that um, he had never, he was very apologetic about doing this and he regretted breaking into this house. And he shared that his, he, he succumbed to peer pressure his friends were always telling him to come with them, come with them. And he always turned them down. But this one time he went and um, the police officer listened to that. And then, and the kid said he, he oh, and in the, in the storytelling that the young man said he liked to play basketball. Well, the police officer shared the harm that was done and how his 10 year old son is fearful to live in the house now because it, it was broken into and he doesn't feel safe. And um Anyway, in the, to the end, um, the request was, uh, what do you need? What does the police officer need from this young man or need for reparation or repair the harm? And the officer got up and he walked over to the, to the young man and the Precious Blood staff didn't know what was going to happen really. And he handed him his business card and he said, I wanna play basketball with you. I'll see you Sunday on the court or something to this effect. Um, he was so moved by what this young boy said. And, and the police officer has a young son, you know, had a young son. And, and I think probably could relate, like, this could be my boy, you know? So you, we're, not, we're not the worst things that we've ever done. We're, we're much more than that. So this is one example of the, like, both parties were changed, were transformed in this. The young man was able, the young, the boy was able to apologize and be freed from the weight of, of the harm he caused. And the police officer was able to offer forgiveness and to connect and build a relationship. That's one example. Wow. I have others, but I, I want to be respectful of the time, Cherry. <laughs> That's, that is an incredible story. So heartwarming. Why should restorative justice matter to people, whether they are people of faith or those with no faith tradition? Sister Kathleen, any thoughts on that? Well, restorative justice is human. Restorative justice is positive. It's enriching. It's community building. It's respectful. It is the answer to a lot of the issues. Um, I just believe it's extremely important. Yeah. Extremely important. Sister Janet, what are your thoughts on that? Why restorative justice should matter to people, whether they're people of faith or have no faith tradition? Well, I agree with Sister Kathleen, and I would build on that saying, because we are one of the most richly blessed nations in the world, and we can do better for all our citizens and for our communities and for our country. We can do better than this. And we, yeah. we must demand uh, respect and value. We must demand um, respect and value for all lives and, uh, and work to build these communities up and restore them. And, and we need to be modeling how to resolve conflict and make reparations and bring about healing. Mm. Yeah. And I think religion whether whether you're of, of this faith or a different faith, we're all human beings. We are all social beings. And whatever is good for one human being can be good for all. And so yeah. what, to me, it, I, it would not make a difference what faith we were, 
-hmm. if if the hu humane, caring, loving process is is taking place. Mm -hmm. And I think we're better than an eye for an eye mentality. We should be so beyond that. And I was thinking um, of my, my great aunt. She was also a Franciscan sister. And I was lamenting her impending death. And she said to me, um, you know, we're not meant for this world. We're meant for so much better. And I think punitive justice um, appeals to our lowest level as humans. And we are meant for so much more. Excellent. I love that. So powerful. So with this uh, series of conversations, of course, we always try to take a closer look at our intersectional issues of racism, migration, and climate. How does restorative justice relate to those issues? Sister Janet, let's start with you. Well, I think certainly um, around the issue of racism, our criminal justice system negatively impacts uh, people of color. And I think it undergirds much of our justice system. Sadly, it undergirds much, much of our uh, justice system from increased police presence in schools and um, increased number of police cars in communities of people of color. And with that, you get more arrests from the schools and from the community. And then you have young people being tried as adults, receiving longer sentences. And, and all, with all of this, you have races. We are a white dominant society with racism threaded through most everything. And so sentencing is longer. You're more likely to be arrested if you're black or brown skinned. You're more likely uh, to be found guilty. You're more likely to have a longer sentence. So, and then um, I think once all that, or, or for a lot of our folks, they're awaiting trial and the conditions are deplorable. And some of them go, are, are really at their wits end and they plea bargain out. They, so they plead guilty to a felony even if they're innocent and um, just to get out of prison because they can't handle you know, their pretrial time. So all of those racism is, is just um, fully present in all of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sister Kathleen, any additional thoughts on how restorative justice relates to our intersectional issues, racism, migration, and climate? Well, I think intersectionality is is acknowledging that everyone has a unique experience of, a, of discrimination. People have more than one identity. And in order to be aware of the, the prejudices that people go through in their lives, it helps us if we are aware of all of the things that can occur to people because how I was treated is totally different than how my treasures have been treated. Mm -hmm. um, our whole surroundings are different. And because of race, like you said, Janet, because of race, um, there are so many strikes against them. And so I believe that if we, if we can become more aware of other, pe other people who we're not familiar with, who we have not had much association with, who we might have preconceived ideas about that are incorrect, if we have the opportunity to speak with and to meet with, then we can, we can come to an understanding of what one another can go through. If we can establish a kinship with those other people, then things would be better all the way around. And um, 
it would alleviate, I think, in, in, in the future, if we become more aware, it would alleviate a lot of the negative things that go on in the world. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sister Janet, I know that you have uh, in-depth knowledge of this topic. How can victims and offenders access restorative justice solutions? How do they access that? Well, I don't know if I have a lot of, sadly, we don't have enough restorative justice structures and, and options for folks in the criminal justice system. Um, one way that when there are structures available, one way would be for the defense attorney to bring that, to bring the request um, to the state's attorney and the judge, um, a request of a restorative justice practice. So a diversion program that would, that would take this case out of the court and into a restorative justice court. In Chicago, we do have three restorative justice community courts. Um, so that would be, that would be and, and those courts are limited though. They're, the first one is about four years old and the other two are just a year old. And they're limited to folks between 19 and 26. And it, they are nonviolent offenses only. And uh, let's see, I think that's two, two of the main things. Um, but they work with them in a, in a circle process and they create a repair of harm agreement. And it takes maybe 18 months to 24, you know, two couple of years to, for them to carry out that repair agreement, depending on the case, of course. Um, but that's one hopeful sign, although even that is, is limited because it's still within the court system. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not a completely community justice, you know, community restorative justice court. Um, but, and, and so that would be one, one option that's available. And then also, as I said earlier, victim offender dialogue. Now that would most more likely be after a person is locked up or incarcerated. And um, oftentimes they will write a letter to the victim maybe expressing their remorse. But those letters, they will not send those letters to the victim. IDOC does not allow those to go to the victim or the survivors. They go into like this bank. And then if the victim at any point in the future says, I want to connect with this offender, then they'll say, oh yeah, well, there's a letter here for you. Oh. So yeah, it's not great. And a lot of, I don't know that a lot of survivors are aware of that or to even ask that question. Um, but however, those that do ask the question, even if there's not a letter and they express an interest in, in meeting the offender, that, then that can begin a, a peace circle or you know, a healing circle. Or, but, and that would take a long time to build up to. You would have a lot of pre-circle pre, um, work before you bring those two parties together. You'd have circles with each one individually. Wow. It's so interesting to go from sort of the theoretical uh, discussion of restorative justice to thinking about how it works from a practical perspective. And good to know, it's, it's sort of a long haul when you enter into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So moving forward, how can we advocate for reform of our criminal justice system to better include restorative justice? Sister Kathleen, let's start with you. Well, I think for, for me, the first thing to do is to become aware of what restorative justice is. Because for me, it's a relatively new, a new topic that I have been exposed to. And the reading about it and learning about it has been so beneficial for me. And if people would go online, there's plenty of things on the internet. Uh, I think connecting with exploring intersections on YouTube and looking at the, the different sections that have taken place already is very educational. I think that the Ignatian Solidarity Network is also an excellent place for information. And there's just lots more there. 
And then the other thing that would help is, is for people somehow maybe get connected to, uh, to someone who is in jail or who has been in jail uh, to have maybe an eye opener that a criminal really is a human person and that a criminal is God's child. They are valuable, even though they did something horrible. They are not their mistake. They are still valuable. And so to me, getting involved in the jail ministry, if people have courage enough, that would be great. And some people don't because they're afraid. But if you were able to, that would take care of the fear. I'm many times asked if I'm afraid to go into the place. I have never been afraid in there. Those, those, those treasures are, they're God's children. You know, people look at them as criminals. No, they're God's children. They did a stupid thing. And if we can get beyond looking at that's a criminal and look at them at that's a person who has experienced a lot of negative stuff and has done negative stuff. So that would be another one. And then the other one would be is to look for people who are involved, search for people who are involved in restorative justice and connect with them and get involved. If they have the time and, and are not, if they have the time, make an effort. Great ideas. Sister Janet, what are your thoughts on how we can advocate for reform of cr our criminal justice system to better include restorative justice? I think one way is to really challenge our uh, justice system to put the, the survivor at the forefront. What are the needs of the survivor? If we start from that place, it's going to include accountability, likely it will include accountability from the offender, from the person who is harmed. And that's going to start the process of a dialogue. Um, so I think that's one thing. Right now, we don't, we say we're all about justice um, for the survivor, but we're not. We don't even ask the survivor what they need. We don't ask them how, they, how we could help them heal. All we wanna do is, we, we hear, you know, oh, you've been harmed. Okay, we're going to lock them up forever, you know, or whatever the sentence may be. So I think really starting with that, um, with the survivor and their needs. And I think also we need to be showing that restorative justice works. So continuing to um, program in schools um, and in the justice system, um, and, and highlighting these programs and, and the effectiveness, um, increasing the victim offender um, dialogue. And I think maybe reaching out to the survivors and encouraging that um, healing, uh, encouraging a restorative approach to, because it is more healing for them than the punitive justice system in a couple of ways. Wonderful. And I know that we discussed jail ministry. Sister Kathleen, you touched on that. I have to mention, I also work on a podcast called Messy Jesus Business. And the upcoming episode, which is due to drop tomorrow, features Deacon Pablo Perez from the Chicago area. He works in jail ministry and has amazing stories about the transformative experience that that has been for him. So if you have an interest in exploring that further, Messy Jesus Business, had to mention that. Uh, unfortunately, due to our tech problems today, we're unable to take audience questions, but I want to invite members of our audience today to post their questions on our Facebook page the Exploring Intersections Facebook page, and then hopefully as our panelists have time, perhaps they can respond or we can respond to those. So with a better understanding of the topic of restorative justice, it's time to talk about our next steps. 
Our panelists have provided some suggested action items to help us as we move forward. Sister Kathleen, please tell us about your action item. Well, one of the things that has been very beneficial for me was reading um, Gregory Boyle's two books. One is Tattoos of the Heart, and the other one is Barking to the Choir. And in there, he talks about God, and he talks about God is not a punitive God. God is the loving God. And he also talks about that it's not a matter of bad people and good people. It's about God's people. And he also talks about kinship is the game changer. Restorative justice brings kinship in the process, which causes changes. And then he says that Jesus was always hopeful about widening the circle of compassion and dismantling barriers that exclude. And so if we could get to the point of, of thinking about including others and thinking about of, of um, connecting with others, that we don't understand or know, those things would be beneficial. And so that's, I just love those two books because they were so beneficial for me. It's easy reading, but he teaches, he teaches us that gang members, criminals are God's children. And they, some are like that because we have excluded them because we have ignored them and because we have discriminated. So that's, that's what I had to offer. That's a great action item, sister. Sister Janet, tell us about your action item. Well, the action item that you see on the screen, I suggested commit to listening to the stories of others and share your story. This is how we get to know each other and build community. I don't think we listen to each other enough and especially in an intentional space, like a circle. And we, I do a lot of peace circle work here and, and keep her training at Precious Blood. And I wanna push that even a little bit further to encourage our listeners to sit and listen to someone you have harmed or someone that you've been in conflict with and um, hear from that person their feelings and what their experience was, um, and then ask the person what they need or, or how you could contribute to their healing. And I think that's the first step that in our everyday relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships, and then in our work teams, that we are listening to each other and that there's a space to share our feelings and ask for what we need and to be open to providing that. Wow, that is a really great action item as well. Thank you. Thank you for those calls to action. And thank you, Sister Kathleen and Sister Janet for sharing your experiences and your thoughts on restorative justice today. Thank you, Cherish. It's wonderful thank to be you. here. Yes. Great. Thank you also to the incredible team of professionals working behind the scenes to bring this program to life every month. Next month on Exploring Intersections, Catholic Sisters on Racism, Migration, and Climate, we're talking about affordable housing. In the midst of a national housing crisis with rampant homelessness, skyrocketing rents, and limited inventory among starter homes, Many are struggling to keep a roof over their heads. What exactly is affordable housing? And what does housing justice look like? As always, we'll look to a panel of guests to help us better understand this complex issue and how it intersects with racism, migration, and climate. That's December 8th at 3 p.m. Central. 
Thank you for joining us today. This series is made possible through the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, Region 10. Visit our website, exploringintersections.org, to find resources mentioned in today's conversation or to register to attend our next program. We broadcast live every second Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central. You can also download podcasts of our panel discussions from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or via our website. And be sure to connect with us for the continuing conversation on Facebook. I'm Cherish Badzinski. Thanks for tuning in to Exploring Intersections.